So I'm I'm going to run through first of all uh, just a handful of some of the key definitions that are uh, appropriate to our topics, uh, and then I, I'm going to look at some statistics, some statistics from the uh, International Federation of Robotics, um, just to give us some background ab about. Uh, how ro where robots are used, which parts of the world they're being used in in great numbers, and and which sort of applications. Uh, it, it's it just it is just to give us some general understanding of the growth that can be expected and and the areas of growth that are being predicted. It is an area that we are of course seeing significant growth in, with um, with the increasing needs of automated automation and so on. But then we'll look at some examples, um, examples of the use of uh, AMRs, autonomous mobile robots, and examples of the use of robots working collaboratively, robots in collaborative applications. And then um, we'll look at a uh, very, very important uh, consideration that we need to uh, have in mind, how we ensure that these, these type of applications, autonomous operation, uh, collaborative applications and so on, how, how they can be performed safely uh, without exposing people around them to um, an unacceptable level of risk. And we'll look at the technologies that are being used on autonomous mobile robots and uh, we'll, we'll finish by looking at how that applies to robots being used in collaborative applications. So those are our, our topics for the next uh, next hour or so. Um, so uh, some definitions. Uh, an industrial robot, we, and we're talking about robots that are used in industry. Uh, uh, our main topics today are all about robots used in industry. We're not talking about particularly about medical robots, service robots, and so on. So an industrial robot is, is quite simply a um, uh, a reprogrammed multi-purpose manipulator that has three or more axes. Um, and they come in all sorts of different shapes and sizes um, and, and are used in um, a, a huge variety of, of applications. So it's, it's difficult to be um, too specific uh, about the, the whole variety of applications we have. But what is of growing importance and growing relevance is the use of robots in a collaborative application. So a collaborative application is defined as an application that contains one or more collaborative tasks. So a blindingly obvious definition, I guess. So the key to it is a collaborative task. And a collaborative task is a task where uh, that involves the use of, of a robot, but a task where a robot and an operator are within the same collaborative workspace. Um, so working without physical separation between the the robot and the and people. Traditionally, of course, industrial robots have been used where they would be enclosed in physical guarding and very, very often called robot cells. The robots would, would be uh, only accessible by people um, entering the, the danger zone, the zone where the robots are, by monitored uh, movable guards or some, some other measures like that. Collaborative applications uh, so are where we're going to acknowledge that there will be uh, people and robots in the same zone uh, so they could come in contact with each other um, so that's the the important thing and um agvs and amrs and imrs uh, the, the terms are used slightly differently in in some cases um we shall look a little later at a, a North American standard that has tried to put some uh, fairly precise definitions on the use of these abbreviated terms. Uh, but in essence, an, an AGV 
is an automatic guided vehicle that follows fixed routes. Uh, so they would typically be following a, a route mapped out and using um, inductive guides embedded in the floor or, or something of that nature. So they uh, work only along the tracks that they've been assigned to. Um, and there is a place for those, of course. They, they, they've been used very, very successfully for many, many years. And, um, and there's still applications which suit that, that kind of um, approach. But what we are seeing more and more, um, and because of the increasing use of more advanced technologies, is, um, is mobile platforms, uh, mobile vehicles that don't have to follow a fixed path, uh, that can navigate by the use of various sensors and various technologies, um, and so they can they can move around dynamically um, and you know, in some cases if it's a, particularly if it's an outdoor application they'll be using gps systems or this kind of thing to map their um, their routes um, but they're working autonomously uh, so those are those kind of platforms are more likely to be uh, described as an an AMR, an autonomous mobile robot, um, and safety has to be assured, of course. So we'll look particularly about what uh, sort of technologies are used to ensure that uh, the AMRs can be deployed safely. And an, an AMR, an industrial mobile robot, is a combination of an AGV or an AMR with uh, an industrial robot mounted um, on the platform uh, so it's um, a combination of the of the two types um, we'll revisit those terms a little later when we talk about the um, north american standard that deals with these topics but those, those are some of the key terms agv and amr i think tend to be used um, interchangeably really but um, but amr is uh, for current technologies is arguably the more correct term. Um, so robots have been around now for, for a very, very long time, uh, 50 years or more uh, since the first year, the uh, first um, robots that could truly have been described as industrial robots were used primarily in the automotive sector. Um, but they, um, their growth has been relatively consistent. In the early years, so the, the use grew quite rapidly until there was a, an incident in a, a painting application in an automotive manufacturing plant in Dearborn in the USA, where the uh, robots decided to go a little bit um, crazy if I could use that expression, um, and some windows got broken, some physical damage was done um, uh, because of this random operation. And it, it, it set back the deployment of industrial robots for a few years. Uh, but then the, um, the, the technologies, the control technologies improved, the chances of those sort of things happening again uh, were lessened, of course. Um, so the, the, they started to be at wider and wider use. And this um, slide on the screen now is from a, a report from the International Federation of Robotics, um, and they uh, produce a, a report um, that looks at the deployment of robots throughout the world. And uh, we can see that from the years 2009 up to 2018, there was steady growth. Um, it was not back, of course, uh, because of the pandemic. Uh, which knocked everything back. So 2019 saw a drop in the um, in the annual installations, but we see that there was um, clear and steady growth for the years before that, and that growth is expected to return. Um, this slide now, this uh, graph shows us the. Uh, percentage of installations according to the three key regions, um, Asia and Australia combined, Europe and, and America. 
and I'm not sure how much Australia counts for in the blue bars on this graph, but I, I suspect it's a relatively minimal amount. So I think what this shows us beyond any doubt is that the key growth areas are in the Asian market. Um, that's where we, we're seeing the, uh, the greater density of uh, robot installations and the greater take up of various technologies. Um, USA is showing as um, less density than Europe, which uh, some may uh, find a little surprising, given that historically the USA has been at the forefront of these things. Um, so uh, it's Asia. Uh, Asia are, are the, uh, the key areas where we're seeing the, the greatest growth. And this, um, this shows the main application areas where robots are, are deployed um, during the last three years, 2000, or the three years 2017 to 2019 uh, from this 2020 report. And you can see that the, 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 the largest number of robots are used in handling applications. Um, so uh, part manipulation, uh, pick and place robots, all of those kind of uh, applications. Um, and once again, we saw that uh, you know th there was a decline in 2019, not a massive decline, but there was a decline in 2019. Um, welding is the next largest application range. Um, and again, this historically, uh, Robot welding has been a very, very significant area, and I think this shows us that it remains a fairly significant area um, of the use of industrial robots. Uh, and then the rest are um, lesser volumes, um, assembling, cleaning, and dispensing, processing, and, and so on. So it's still handling and welding robots combined that are the, the, the huge areas for in industrial robots in particular. And the uh, importance of manufacturing robots is uh, shown in this prediction here. Again, it's from the same report from, um, uh, sorry, not from the same report. It's a, a, a different report, my apologies, uh, from uh, the uh, DigiWorld report of robotics. Uh, showing the predictive growth in um, by applications and the two big ones are manufacturing robots and logistics robots. Uh, so they're the sort of things that are, that are used in industry in, uh, in manufacturing and commercial um, applications. Uh, the use of health robots is it's growing, um, but they don't have the, anything like the same volumes and uh, the other areas of agriculture, business, business, service robots, domestic robots, again, are accounting for, um, for, for the top of the columns there. But the, the big columns, the big blocks are manufacturing and logistics robots. And that's where we see industrial robots and AMRs, AGVs, IMRs, are, uh, are in those two sectors, manufacturing and logistics. So some examples uh, where we would see um, autonomous mobile robots, um, uh, the, the, the next few examples are taken from um, press releases by different organizations. Uh, so Farisha, uh, tier two supply in the automotive sector, uh, are deploying um, a AMRs from a company called Mir. Um, and on the screen now, we can see that the, there are three uh, particular types of application that use AMRs. The one in the middle is transporting around a, a rack, um, something that stores components, so it can deliver components to machine locations, and, and collect components from racks and, and carry the racks around to different areas. Uh, the one on the left is a mobile conveyor section. Um, so that could be deployed at, um, at robot at 
conveyor sections to to help with the flow of products and could increase flexibility uh, by being able to simply uh, redeploy the uh, small conveyor transfer conveyor section whatever it is to to a new location um, very very straightforwardly and the one on the right is um, an example of an IMR an industrial mobile robot where on an AMR platform there's an, a, a robot manipulator mounted on the platform uh, so that's the uh, uh, typical example of so where you could have a handling robot a uh, a robot perhaps doing some basic um, machining tests and so on uh, that can be moved around from uh, position to position. There was one uh, study conducted quite a few years ago now uh, which was using those sort of combinations, uh, a robot on a AMR platform in the aerospace uh, sector in aircraft body manufacturing and the um, that, that project was to try and bring principles that have been developed in automotive manufacturing into the aerospace sector um, and they were uh, using the um, IMRs to do the riveting and, and fixings on uh, aerospace structures. So those are um, say some examples showing three typical tasks that, uh, that would be carried out by um, mobile platforms. Another clip from a press release about Skoda, um, and they're using Omron's uh, logistics robots. So in the center of the screen there, we can see a, a, a robot manipulator, an AMR um, autonomous manipulator carrying parts from uh, machine section to machine section. Uh, but above that, there is what is a, a combination of a manually operated forklift truck um, uh, that has been also equipped for autonomous operation uh, so it can it can function both as a, a, a traditional manually driven device or it can be operated um, autonomously so combinations of manual and autonomous operation uh, I guess it won't be a surprise to anyone to know that a, a very large user of uh, AMRs is uh, Amazon. Um, Amazon have got a, a very, very active uh, department, uh, department di a division more than a department, I think, uh, operating in various parts of the world for deployment of advanced robotics technologies and um, and understandably part of that, a big part of that is their AMRs that move those product storage racks around uh, around the warehouse floor. And you can see from the picture on the right there that th those racks uh, are very, very tall. Um, they uh, can be quite weighty, very, very heavy. And the, uh, the AMRs have to operate very, very smoothly. Otherwise, you know, they, they, they would be um, pos prom uh, the uh, danger of them toppling over and so on. So the the, uh, the the basic warehouse floor structure becomes also critically important uh, to make sure that they have a smooth operating plate. Um, so those are some examples of the deployment of AMRs. They, they, um, AGVs, AMRs, they, they are growing in use exponentially um, and they um, they're extremely effective at uh, the sort of things they they need to uh, take the humans out of the picture and make sure that these tasks these simple tasks of relatively simple tasks of moving product from one position to another are, are done with uh, with autonomous mobile robots another area which is of again a growing importance we see more and more deployment is in what are generally simply referred to as cobots uh, an abbreviation of collaborative robots um, my personal preference is that uh, we emphasize the fact that these are robots being used in collaborative applications and um, 
not all applications we'll, we'll revisit this in a few minutes again but not all applications that are uh, uh, developed for the uh, using these so-called cobots are suitable for collaborative working um, so uh, the use of the word cobots has become uh, universal everybody talks about uh, cobots but it is extremely important that we consider the uh, the application which we'll come to in a few minutes so here's um, a, a universal robot a ur robot being used in a machining application so it's uh, clearly it's uh, the manufacturing of engine blocks so there's an engine block there and the end effector on the UR robot has uh, got some uh, it looks like some drilling attachments so it can be doing some drilling and tapping tasks on the engine block itself um, machine loading is a uh, again a huge area where the um, we have collaborative operations collaborative tasks between robots and humans uh, machine tending machine loading um, uh, it's a, a dull repetitive task where the human can be replaced by a robot um, and that, i think it was was one of the original as far as i can recall one of the original promoted areas for collaborative applications and uh, this is a, a, a fanuc um, robot that is being used as part of a, a cell to aid with inspection so the uh, precise inspection is aided by having very accurate positioning from uh, a robot uh, but it's operated collaboratively the, the robot is in a fixed position um, but there's a, a person loading the sample in the, showing this picture is obviously in the same work zone the same collaborative workspace as the the robot and th those applications we've just seen are clearly their their industrial applications and that's where we're seeing the the huge growth huge deployment but uh, but robots that are designed for collaborative applications don't always get used in industrial settings and um, in, in fact this is a an example of a the use of a uh, a pair of robot arms that are deployed as a robotic chef um, and this is a real application this isn't made up uh, you could um, search, type robotic chef or mobile robotics into a search engine and, uh, and see videos of this in in operation uh, it um, can reproduce meals for you it comes as part of a robotic kitchen um, and it's a, a very novel uh, application it, it is despite the looks of it uh, with all the stylized uh, bits on it that, that is a pair of universal robot arms configured to replicate the actions of, of a chef uh, lots of safety features built into that i have to say but but that's a um, an, a, an example of an application using these typical industrial style robots but in a non-industrial environment so it is of course extremely important that we ensure that people working in and around these um, amrs imrs uh, collaborative applications and so on are protected from the possibility of harm um, protected so that they are not going to be exposed to an unacceptable level of harm and in a an amr that's done by uh, combi combinations of sensors um, and this game this is some um, information taken from the mere mobile industrial Res uh, robots company in sweden uh, from about their systems um, and they're I guess the, the primary level of protection is using area scanners, laser laser scanners, area scanners, active optoelectronic protection devices um, that are two-dimensional uh, devices that can scan a field um, 
and uh, the program to scan uh, various areas around them. Um, they uh, typically uh, have a 270 degree um, area that they can scan. Uh, so they would be deployed perhaps on uh, two corners of a, an AMR between a combination. Uh, you've got 360 degree coverage uh, covering all uh, all sides of the, of the device. And they're programmed uh, to say that if, if there's an obstacle in the path, uh, it will be detected by, by the scanner and um, an action be take, can be taken by the AMR to either simply see, of course, it's just a stop, um, but they could also have onboard systems that would um, allow them perhaps to dynamically change the path so they can go around the obstacle. So all sorts of uh, varieties of things that could be, um, could be uh, configured for being triggered by the by the area scanners, the laser scanners, um, but they also include uh, combinations of um, camera-based systems um, that are three-dimensional. The, the area scanner, by the way, is a two-dimensional um, device. Um, by the use of three D cameras, you can get a a, a more uh, Co comprehensive picture of the area surrounding the AMR um, and that can also be used as part of the safety monitoring uh, system and then as uh, the the final picture on the right there shows there's they can have uh, sensors that are looking down from the overhang of the platform down to the floor level um, that can uh, detect if it's uh, detect the feet of people or or other objects that would uh, would be below the range of the of the laser typically so a whole um, range of different technologies that are combined uh, to be used together to to give us an adequate level of protection an adequate level of protection uh, generally means that to conform to the uh, international standards for robotics um, we the safety related parts have to meet a clearly defined performance level with a defined architecture and um, the two standards that are stated uh, within the robots and the robot standard by the way is ISO 210218 which is in two parts um, uh, 10218 part one is for robot manufacturers, 10218 part two for the um, applications of robots, integration of robots. And uh, the, those standards require that the safety related parts need to meet if we're looking at the requirements of the functional safety standard ISO 13849, which is uh, being referenced on the table on the screen now. They have to meet performance level D with category three architecture. Uh, the other standard we'll see in a, a few minutes is uh, an IC standard called 62061. Um, so you can see that, again, this is information from MIR. The, uh, with the exception of their very small, low risk devices, all of the safety functions on their larger platforms are um, designed to meet the requirements uh, specified in 10218 so they're all capable of performance level D and they've uh, achieved that by the use of category 3 architecture a little bit more about that in just a few minutes time um, but some of the technologies that, that are used are used in combinations uh, as we saw the you know you got a, a an AMR we perhaps have a combination of two dimensional laser scanners being used with 3D uh, camera technologies and so on. And these things need to be combined in, in a way that ensures that we're meeting the requirements for risk reduction provided by the control functions. And the, a laser scanner, also called an AOPDDR, are uh, established technology. They, they've been around for a long, long time. They're, they're well understood. They're, they're used in 
lots and lots of different applications, not just in mobile um, or auton autonomous applications. They're used in fixed installations and, and so on. Um, but there is an increasing use of emerging technologies being used in the field um, where uh, things like radar and LIDAR uh, are being used as giving a, a, a making a contribution to the overall safety. Um, so not just relying on, on traditional approaches, but using combinations of, of different sensors. And that has led to the development of specific um, publications from um, standards bodies to try and give some uh, clear guidance about how to combine these technologies. So the functional safety standards, the, the two at the bottom left of the screen now, ISO 13849, IC 62061, are the two standards that cover uh, functional safety for machinery applications. Um, AMRs, IMRs and co collaborative applications are within the scope of those standards. Um, the uh, Generic standard for functional safety is a standard called IC 61508 and, and both 13849 and 6061 have a relationship with, uh, with 61508. Um, but the combination of sensors that can be used to meet the targets specified from those functional safety standards uh, is now assisted by a publication of a technical specification called 62998, where that, uh, that gives some guidance on the deployment of various sensor technologies. And on the right hand side, we've got some standards that are relevant to sensor technologies. Uh, the use of uh, sensors developed um, that are going to be used uh, in safety applications, how they can be combined to give us systematic safety capability um, that can then be demonstrated to meet the requirements of the functional safety standards. So 62998, if you like, uh, provides the link between the sensor standards and the functional safety standards. Um, 62998 is in two parts, uh, where part two is actually a worked example of an outdoor AMR based on an outdoor AMR, how different sensor technologies have been used to create the, um, the appropriate levels of systematic safety integrity. For collaborative applications, uh, again, this is covered in 10218. Uh, 10218 uh, has got specific requirements about collaborative applications um, and it describes four separate types of collaborative application um, where the first one is uh, called a safety related monitored stop um, we'll see a, a little bit more detail about these four uh, immediately following this slide down. Uh, the, the second is using something called hand guiding. Uh, the third method is speed and separation monitoring, uh, which has got some correspondence to the first method. Um, and the fourth method is power and force limiting. And of these four methods, I think the one that was most likely to be um, being looked at in practice is, is power and force limiting. So just a, a briefly a, a word about these, these four separate methods um, that are used in um, collaborative applications. So safety related monitored stop, um, the example shown here are using area scanners. Again, a typical use of an area scanner um, where showing the, the graphic here is showing that there is a, um, a robot that is protected on two sides by physical guarding. So you, you know, there's a, a, a physical barrier between people and, and the robot, but the other two sides are open 
uh, but are being monitored by a, an area scanner, a laser scanner. And that scanner would be programmed. It could be programmed with different zones and can do a lot of more advanced things like zone switching and things like that. But in, in the graphic we've got on the screen now, typically the, the red zone would be a trip zone. So if, if there was anything detected um, in that red zone, we would get a safety rated monitored stop from the robot. The robot would go to a standstill. And, uh, and would remain at a standstill and it's confirmed until it's confirmed that the area is clear and it could go back to normal operation. Um, that, that principle has, has, has been well established and has been used in, um, in applications where the, the robot itself wasn't necessarily designed for collaborative application because the you know, in that, although it's an unprotected workspace from a physical point of view, um, we can't have people and the robot in the same area at the same time whilst the robot is capable of moving. Hand guiding is um, a case where it's typically used for, for teaching the, the robot, teaching a robot's path, where uh, the robot is, a, is allowed to have some power to the robot actuators while somebody is in direct contact with it, as we can see in the uh, in the picture here. And um, uh, so the, the the teacher of the robot, the operator, is now perhaps going through a, a routine where he's teaching the robot its path. Uh, the robot may have been deployed to a new position, gone to a new machine or whatever. Uh, so it's, it's running it through the, the path that it would need for this specific application. And whilst that's happening, there have to be other measures in place. Uh, the robot will only be allowed to move with uh, a safe limited speed. Uh, there has to be an, an enabling device. Uh, an enabling device is uh, sometimes term used for an enabling device, a dead man's handle. It's typically a device that is a handheld device that has to be held in a mid position. Um, so if you uh, release it, the enable is removed. If you grip it tightly, the enable is removed, that type of thing. So um, and once the enable is removed, the, the robot has to stop. And there also has to be a, a local emergency stop um, in the uh, uh, deployed in the area as well. So, um, but the robot is has power to the actuators whilst it's being guided. The third um, application, so this is a sort of a combination of separation monitoring and, and safety rated uh, stop monitoring where we have some, uh, again, uh, area scanners are typically used to provide this kind of, um, uh, this particular kind of separ uh, uh, protective arrangement where uh, if someone is getting closer to the robot, uh, going into the orange zone, the yellow zone, as we can see on this, this slide now, uh, the robot will reduce its speed, um, uh, perhaps give a warning, um, and then if uh, if you get too close, it will go to a, a stop condition. Um, so it's got got quite a lot in common with the with the first methods, uh, saturated monitored stop. But the fourth method is arguably the most common, and. Uh, comes with perhaps the most concerns, um, which is power and force limiting. So in, in this method, it is acknowledged that um, robots will be operating normally whilst people are in the vicinity, whilst people in the, in the collaborative workspace. So it is acknowledged that there is a possibility quite a strong possibility, I, I dare say, that uh, the, the person and a person and the robot will come together at some point during the operating cycle, whilst the robot is, is operating. 
So what's needed here is to say that um, if that happens, or perhaps it may be more correct to say when that happens, the uh, power and force delivered through the robot, including its end effectors, the tooling that's mounted on the robot, um, has to be sufficiently controlled to ensure that an unacceptable level of pain isn't inflicted on the person. Uh, so this, this brings about a concept which creates a reasonable amount of concern that we're saying, okay, we're going to accept that a, a person can come into contact with a moving pot um, and can be subject to direct contact, uh, can have some some force uh, from the moving part before the moving part needs to stop. Okay. Um, so again, this is described, the basic concept are described in 10218, but the uh, detail about how we go about uh, ensuring that things are safe is contained in a technical specification. Uh, it's uh, TS15066. Um, where a, a study was carried out at a German university, the University of Mainz, uh, where they exposed people uh, to various points on their body. As you can see, there are uh, 29 specific body areas um, where they monitored people uh, with what's uh, called quasi-static contact. Uh, um, could be described as a crushing force, a crushing hazard, being trapped between two moving parts or between a moving part and a fixed part, and also for transient contact, where the, um, the moving part of the robot would would uh, would hit you, but you would uh, be knocked out of the way. For for example, wouldn't wouldn't draw you in, wouldn't crush. So the um, The result of this study was that it was they came up with some acceptable force limits depending on which part of the body is likely likely to be exposed. Um, and these force limits they are, are published in the TS15066 in a table. This is the top part of the table as you can see. And um, you can see that there, there are maximum allowable pressures in newtons per uh, centimeter squared in the um, quasi-static column there and maximum force in newtons. Uh, and the allowance for transient contact is twice the force, twice the pressure uh, as for uh, static um, contact. So this needs very very careful um setting up uh, very careful consideration and ensuring that you these targets have been met does need specialized equipment um and, and people have to be trained obviously and competent in the use of that specialized equipment um you you can see that the top of the thing there the critical zone is um not allowed for transient contact so face and skull and forehead is uh, um, typically you you wouldn't rely on power and force limiting you won't mustn't allow on power and force limiting to reduce the risk associated with that area it has to be uh, more traditional uh, protection um, to take an account of if that's the risk um, and what this means is that it we have to work on the assumption that even if something is called a cobot, it's designed to be used in collaborative applications, it doesn't mean it's automatically safe to use alongside workers. We still have to ensure, we must ensure that people aren't exposed to an unacceptable level of risk. So a, a robust risk assessment is vital and <clears throat> i am sure a, a lot of you listening if not all of you listening will have seen the news last week where a um in a, a robotics chess game 
the human opponent had uh, injured their finger. I think it's been described as broken finger. I'm, I'm not quite sure of the true details of this, uh, but uh, a, a cobot uh, being deployed as a chess player uh, actually grabbed the finger of their opponent. And I think what is uh, clear out, out of that is that the, the a robust risk assessment of, had not been carried out here, that the end effect of the grippers were not designed uh, suitable for the potential that they could grab somebody's finger, the power and force exerted was not limited and so on. So the, um, I think the, the, the key thing that went wrong here is that the, um, the guidance about uh, task-based risk assessment and necessary measures wasn't correctly employed. So a few moments ago, I mentioned that um, the safety related controls for all of these things, uh, for, for the four ways of protecting uh, collaborative applications and for all other aspects, autonomous mobile robots and so on, um, need to meet. Sorry, my screen has just changed for some reason. Um, I don't know. Uh, okay. I don't know. I'm. I'm sorry. I'm. I'm dithering here because it seems to me as though you're not, your the attendees are no longer seeing my slides. Ah, they, they've come back. Perhaps that was. Uh, perhaps that was a transition. I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> the ten two one eight describes currently. Um, this standard is. Uh, due for change, it's overdue for change, I might say. So some of these aspects might be slightly different in the um, next version of the standard. But I mentioned it briefly a, a little while ago that the safety related parts have to meet uh, performance level D with category three architecture if we're working with 13849 or SIL2, safety, safety integrity level two with hardware fault torrent one if we're using the IC standard, the, um, IC 6061. What that means is that we have to be able to demonstrate that the safety related functions have got a suitably low probability uh, of dangerous failure, um, quantified down to very, very small probabilities, and that we have um, redundant architectures in our controls. So we have two separate channels in our safety related controls each one, each channel being capable of providing the, the safety function. Um, the standard that I referred to, American standard I referred to right at the beginning was developed by um, the Robot Industries Association, which have now changed their name to AS3 or something they, they call themselves now. Um, but in conjunction with the um, with ANSI, the American National Standards Body, um, and they produced a, a standard part of their R15 series, R1508. Um, it, it's 18 months old or so now, a little more than 18 months old, but this standard was set out to fill a gap where uh, the traditional standards for AGVs, for driverless trucks, one of the titles in one of the standards, um, wasn't really up to date with the growing deployment of AMRs and IMRs. So they, in this standard, that's where they came up with these uh, definitions of uh, IMRs uh, as three different types, type A, B, and C, where an IMR type A is an autonomous mobile robot. That's the mobile platform only, um, something that moves racks around, moves fixtures around and so on, as uh, we saw in an example earlier. Uh, a type B is an IMR type A with um, a, an attachment, but a, a passive attachment. So the, again, the example we saw earlier with a conveyor section on an AMR would be a type B uh, in this, um, in, by this definition. And a type C is an, an AMR or an AGV, 
that has an industrial manipulator, so an industrial, a, a true industrial mobile robot. Um, the, uh, the standard does give us uh, some clear guidance about how we can make the choice. These flow charts now are, uh, uh, summarize the uh, way we would go about uh, checking whether we should consider something to be a, a type A, a type B, or a type a type C. It had been intended, or may, maybe still is intended, that this will also be the basis of a new ISO standard, a truly international standard. Um, but I'm, I'm not sure exactly where that work is. But if, um, if we're looking at deployment of these things, this particular publication, 1508, does give us some very, very helpful guidance. And, and that really uh, brings me to the, um, to the end of the topics. Um, this, this final slide here is, again, it is copied directly from the IFR uh, World Robotics Study, uh, where their they, they, they conclusions, their summary was that there are still many what they call 4D jobs, dual dangerous, detected, dirty jobs, uh, tasks that, are, uh, that can be done by robots. So, you know, it brings improvements to uh, worker health, job satisfaction and so on. Uh, we are living in ageing societies, and that means uh, a workforce, uh, a, an ageing workforce simply doesn't have the physical strength that a, a younger workforce has. And there is a, a, a exponential, I, I think it's, it's not tr entirely untrue to say, exponential growth in technology, um, going with smart manufacturing, whether we call it smart manufacturing, um, uh, industry 4.0 or whatever, uh, the, these things are we are seeing much, much more of it, and there are strong arguments say that we get a good return on investment uh, by by using robotics and more flexibility in our production layouts, um, smaller comfort and so on and so on. 